Despite what English naturalist Charles Darwin hypothesized in his 1871 book Descent of Man, many late 19th century evolutionary naturalists believed that Asia, not Africa, was the birthplace of humanity because it is midway between Europe and America, providing optimal dispersal routes throughout the world. Among these was German biologist Ernst Haeckel, who claimed that the earliest human species originated from a genus he called Pithecanthropus, on the now-debunked fictitious continent Lemuria, in what is now Southeast Asia. Because Lemuria was said to have sunk beneath the Indian Ocean, no fossils could be recovered to prove this. Yet, Haeckel's model spurred Dutch scientist Eugene Dubois to join the quest for his missing link in Indonesia. In 1893, he discovered a skullcap and a femur from the late Pliocene or early Pleistocene at the site along the Solo River and named it Pithecanthropus erectus. He made an unsuccessful attempt to persuade the European scientific community that he had discovered an upright walking ape man. They mostly dismissed his discoveries as the result of a deformed non human primate. Solo man, aka Homo erectus soloensis, is a Homo erectus subspecies that lived near the Solo River in the lush rainforests of Java, Indonesia, until around 117,000 to 108,000 years ago in the late Pleistocene. This population is the species' last known record. It is known from 14 skullcaps, two tibii, and a fragment of the pelvis excavated near the village of Ngandong, as well as three skulls and a skull from Sambung Makan, depending on categorization. Solo man, along with elephants, tigers, wild cattle, water buffalo, tapirs, and hippopotamuses, most likely lived in an open forest setting much cooler than present-day Java. They made rudimentary flakes and choppers, handheld stone tools, as well as spears or harpoons from bones, daggers from stingrays, and andesite bowlers or hammer stones. Solo man could have descended from, or been related to, Java man, then Gandong specimens most likely died as a result of a volcanic event. The species most likely became extinct as a result of the invasion of tropical rainforest, and loss of preferred habitat around 125,000 years ago. The skulls were damaged, however it is unknown if this was due to an assault, cannibalism, the volcanic explosion, or the fossilization process. Anthropologist Ralph von Koenigswald presented a 14-page overview of the research with numerous unpublished discoveries in his 1956 book Meeting Prehistoric Man. The exact position of these fossils in the Solo Terrace at the time of discovery was unknown. All 14 specimens were discovered in the upper section of layer 2, of 6 layers, a 46 cm 18 inches thick stratum of gravelly sand and volcanoclastic hypersthene andesite. These are assumed to have been deposited at the same period, most likely in a now dry arm of the Solo River about 20 meters, 66 feet, above the contemporary river. The location is approximately 40 meters, 130 feet, above sea level. Volcaniclastic rock suggests that deposition took place shortly after a volcanic eruption. Humans and animals may have congregated in large numbers in the valley upstream from the site as a result of the eruption or prolonged drought. The ash would have poisoned or hampered the vegetation's growth, resulting in famine and death among herbivores and humans, building a mound of bodies decomposing over several months. A lack of carnivore damage may imply that adequate eating was attainable without the need for bone crunching. When the monsoon season arrived, lahars flowing from the volcano down the river channels pushed the corpses to the Ngandong site, where they and other debris caused a jam due to the narrowing of the channel there. Homo erectus fossils from Sambung Makan, also along the Solo River, may have been deposited during that time of primeval terror and savagery. Archaeologists dated Solo Man to the Enian Interglacial, which was around 150 to 100,000 years ago from the middle to late Pleistocene transition, based on the site's elevation above the present day river. Subsequent biochronological studies, using animal remains to constrain the age agreed on a late Pleistocene dating within the next few years. The Solo Man remains were radiometrically dated for the first time in 1988, and then again in 1989, using uranium thorium dating to 200 to 30,000 years ago, with a large error range. Solo Man teeth were dated to 53.3 to 27,000 years ago in 1996 using electron spin, resonance dating and uranium thorium isotope ratio mass spectrometry 
this would mean solo man outlasted continental Homo erectus by at least 250,000 years, and was contemporaneous with modern humans in Southeast Asia, who immigrated around 55 to 50,000 years ago. Gamma spectroscopy on three of the skulls revealed uranium leaching in 2008, and the solo man remains were redated to between 70 and 40,000 years old. This still leaves the possibility that solo man existed at the same time as modern people. Dating of pumice hornblende produced a maximum age of 546,000 years ago, while ESR and uranium thorium dating of a mammalian bone from the Jigo eyesight produced a minimum date of 143 to 77,000 years ago. This vast time span suggests that Solo Man lived alongside continental Homo erectus, long before modern humans scattered over the continent. The first comprehensive chronology of the Ngandong site was published in 2020, revealing that the Solo River was diverted through the site 500,000 years ago. The Solo Terrace was deposited between 316 and 31,000 years ago. The Ngandong Terrace between 141 and 92,000 years ago and the Homo erectus bone bed between 117 and 108,000 years ago. This would imply that Solo Man was the last known Homo erectus community and had no contact with modern people. Researchers made preliminary comparisons between the Solo Man skull and those of Rhodesian Man from Africa and Neanderthals. Humans were thought to have originated in Central Asia at the time. Early anthropologists thought Asia was the mother of continents and that the rise of the Himalayas and Tibet, followed by the drying of the region, pushed human ancestors to become terrestrial and bipedal. They initially thought the Ngandong material was an Asian Neanderthal more closely related to the Rhodesian man, also considered a Neanderthal type at the time. They believed the Chinese Peking man spread west and gave rise to the Neanderthals. As a result, the ancient Java man, Solo man, and Rhodesian man were frequently lumped into the same lineage. This was an expansion of the theory of modern human multi-regional origins, which held that all modern people evolved independently from a local archaic human species. In the 1940s, Solo man was designated as a Neanderthal, Neanderthalian, or Neanderthaloid group, for specimens that appeared to be transitional between Homo erectus and Homo sapiens. Homo erectus has been proposed as a subspecies, Homo sapiens erectus, based on their overlapping morphology and the traditional concept of species, although the definitions of species and subspecies, particularly in paleoanthropology, are poorly delineated. As African species became widely regarded as human ancestors in the 1980s, the out of Africa idea supplanted the out of Asia and multi regional theories. As a result, the multi regional model was rebuilt into small communities of archaic humans who interbred and provided at least some ancestry to modern populations in their particular locations, dubbed the assimilation model. This result is contradicted by the age of 117 to 108,000 years ago for Solo Man, which predates modern humans spread through Southeast Asia, and later into Australia. Solo Man has no living progeny due to his ancient date. A recent genomic analysis that examined the genomes of over 400 modern humans, 200 of whom came from island Southeast Asia, revealed no signs of superarchaic introgression. The closure of the cranial sutures, presuming they closed at a rate comparable to modern humans, was used to determine if the animal was an adult or a juvenile, though they may have closed at earlier ages in Homo erectus. The cranium of Solo Man is extremely thick, ranging from double to triple that of modern humans, which is typical of Homo erectus. Male and female specimens were distinguished by the assumption that males are more robust than females, despite the fact that both males and females are particularly robust in comparison to other Asian Homo erectus. Adult skulls measure 202 mm by 152 mm, 8.0 inches by 6.0 inches, in length and breadth, and are proportionately similar to the Peking man but have a much bigger circumference. Skull V is the longest measuring 221 mm 8.7 inches. In comparison, current human skulls measure 176 mm 145 mm, 6.9 in 5.7 inches, for men and 171 mm 140 mm, 6.7 in kinds 5.5 inches, for women. In profile, 
The solo man skull is oval shaped, with heavy brows, inflated cheeks, and a noticeable bone bar running around the back. The brain volume ranged from 1013 to 1251 cubic centimeters, compared to an average of 1270 cubic centimeters for current males and 1, 130 cubic centimeters for modern females. Males were likely significantly larger than females, with one potentially female specimen standing 158 centimeters, 5 feet 2 inches, tall and weighing 51 kilograms, 112 pounds. Solo man resembled the much older Java man Homo erectus that had previously inhabited Java, but was significantly less archaic. The solo man remains exhibit more derived characteristics than more archaic Jovan Homo erectus, most notably a larger brain size, an elevated cranial vault, less post-orbital constriction, and less developed brow ridges. They nevertheless have a striking resemblance to early Homo erectus. There was a tiny sagittal keel running across the midline of the head, similar to Peking man. The brow is relatively low and has a low angle of inclination as compared to other Asian Homo erectus. The brow ridges do not create a continuous bar as in Peking man, but instead curve downwards at the midline to form a nasal bridge. The frontal sinuses are restricted to between the eyes, rather than extending into the brow region, as in Peking man. In comparison to Neanderthals and modern humans, the area covered by the temporal muscle is very flat. The brow ridges blend into thickened cheekbones. The skull is phenozygous in that the skull cap is proportionally narrower than the cheekbones, allowing the latter to be seen while looking down at the skull from above. The squamous section of the temporal bone, like that of Peking man, is triangular, and the infratemporal crest is fairly sharp. The inferior and superior temporal lines, on the parietal bone, diverge towards the back of the head, as they did in earlier Java Homo erectus. A prominent, thick occipital torus, a projecting bar of bone, near the back of the skull reveals an obvious boundary between the occipital and nuchal planes. In modern humans, the occipital torus projects the greatest at the portion corresponding to the external occipital protuberance. The temporal bone base is more consistent with Java man and Peking man than with Neanderthals and modern humans. The brain case space, and consequently the brain, appears to have been flat rather than curved. The opening at the pituitary gland at the base of the skull is much larger than that of modern humans, which has been linked to an enlarged gland that caused the unusual thickening of the bones due to high quantities of testosterone and other hormones. Thick bones would also have supported a hugely powerful physique, unrivaled in current people. At the species level, the Ngandong fauna is similar to the older fauna from 800 to 700,000 years ago, when huge mammal species, including Asian elephants and stegodont, migrated to Java in great numbers. The tiger, Malayan tapir, hippo, deer, water buffalo, wild cows, pigs, and crab-eating macaque are among the other Ngandong fauna. They are typical of an open woodland setting. The presence of a common crane in a nearby contemporaneous site could indicate significantly cooler circumstances than now. The driest conditions most likely occurred around 135,000 years ago, exposing the Sunda Shelf and connecting the major Indonesian islands to the continent. By 125,000 years ago, the environment had become substantially wetter, transforming Java into an island and allowing tropical rainforests to expand. This resulted in the secession of the Ngandong fauna by the Punung fauna, which represents the modern-day animal assemblage of Java, though more typical Punung fauna, namely orangutans and gibbons were unlikely to be able to penetrate the island until it was reconnected to the continent after 80,000 years ago. The loss of the remaining open habitat re Fugia likely led to the extinction of Homo erectus, a specialist in forest and savanna biomes. Solo man was the final population in a lengthy history of Homo erectus habitation of the island of Java, beginning 1.51 million years ago at the Sangaran site continuing 540 to 430,000 years ago at the Trinil site, and finally 117 to 108,000 years ago at Ngandong. If the date for Solo Man is true, they would represent a last population of Homo erectus that sheltered in East Asia's remaining open habitat refuges before the rainforest took over. Based on the sheer number of specimens buried at Ngandong at the same time, 
there may have been a sizable population of solo man prior to the volcanic eruption that resulted in their internment, but population estimates are difficult to make with precision. The Ngandong site was located some distance from the island's northern coast, although it is unknown where the southern shoreline and the mouth of the Solo River would have been. In studying photographs, anthropologists noticed various shattered animal bone fragments, including damage to a huge tiger skull and several deer antlers, which they interpreted as evidence of bone technology. They proposed that some deer antlers be hafted with a carved bird skull to be used as axes. They also suggested that a long piece of bone engraved with an undulating pattern on both sides was used as a harpoon, comparable to Magdalenian harpoons, whereas Weidenreich viewed it as a spearhead. They observed unusual inland stingray stingers at Ngandong, which he assumed were collected by Solo Man for use as daggers or arrowheads, as some recent South Pacific peoples had done. It is uncertain whether this apparent bone technology may be linked to Solo Man or later modern human activities but the erectus population appears to have worked with such material, making scrapers out of pseudodon shells and possibly opening them up with shark teeth. One of these shells includes zigzag marks, which have been interpreted as a type of adornment or personal marking. A completely round andesite stone ball from Gandong, a regular occurrence in the Solo Valley, was also discovered, with a diameter ranging from 67 to 92 mm, 2.6 to 3.6 in. Similar balls have been discovered in contemporaneous and younger European Mousterian and African Middle Stone Age sites, as well as sites as old as the African Acheulean. Originally, these were understood as bowlers, two or three linked together and thrown as a hunting weapon, but they might also represent individually thrown projectiles, club heads, or plant processing or bone breaking tools. Archaeologists also demonstrated that the spherical shape could be easily replicated by using the stone as a hammer for a prolonged period of time. Because so few tools have been discovered, it is impossible to place Solo Man in a specific industry. The Ngandong site, like many other Southeast Asian prehistoric sites, lacks sophisticated choppers, hand axes, or any other complex chopping instrument indicative of the Acheulean of Western Eurasian and African sites. It has been proposed that this was due to a significant technological divide between western and eastern Homo erectus caused by a significant difference in habitat, open savanna versus tropical rainforest, as the chopping tools are commonly interpreted as evidence of big game hunting, which he believed was only possible when humans spread out onto open plains. Despite the finding of some hand axe technology in Middle Pleistocene East Asia, hand axes are still notably scarce and rudimentary in East Asia when compared to western counterparts. This has been explained as follows. The Acheulean emerged in Africa after human dispersal through East Asia, but this would require the two populations to have been separated for nearly two million years. East Asia had poorer quality raw materials, namely quartz and quartzite, but some Chinese localities produced hand axes from these materials and East Asia is not entirely devoid of higher quality minerals. Or East Asian Homo erectus used biodegradable bamboo instead of stone. Researchers also noted significant injuries in skulls 4 and 6, which they suspected were produced by a cutting and blunt instrument, respectively. They show signs of inflammation and healing, indicating that the individual survived the altercation. Von Koenigswald remarked that only the skull caps were discovered, with no teeth, which is quite unusual. As a result, they regarded skulls 4 and 6 as victims of an unsuccessful assault and the other skulls with the base broken out as the result of more successful attempts to slay the victims, supposing this was done by other people to reach and consume the brain. They were confused if this was done by a neighboring tribe or by more advanced human beings who would have demonstrated their superior civilization, by executing their more primitive neighbor. The latter possibility had already been hypothesized for the Peking man, which shows similarly prominent pathologies. Despite this, Von Koenigswald admitted that some of the injuries could have been caused by the volcanic eruption. Von Koenigswald proposed that only skull caps exist because Solo Man was altering skulls into skull cups, but others were suspicious since the jagged rims of skulls I, V, and X, in particular, are not well adapted for this purpose. Cannibalism and ritual headhunting have also been proposed for other sites in Java, based on the absence of any additional remains than the skull cap. Conversely, because the base of the skull is weaker than the skull cap, 
and because the remains were transported via a river with large stones and boulders, this was a natural occurrence. In terms of the absence of the rest of the skeleton, if tiger predation was a role, tigers would normally only leave the head because it has the least amount of meat on it. Furthermore, the Ngandong material was damaged during excavation, cleaning, and preparation, particularly skulls iron 9. The classification of Ngandong hominids as Homo sapiens is a point of contention in paleoanthropology. According to the replacement hypothesis, late Pleistocene Africans and Levantines are direct predecessors of modern humans, while Ngandong hominids are not. According to the multi-regional concept, Pleistocene Africans, Levantines, and Ngandong are likely ancestors of Solo Man, making him an archaic Homo sapiens. Genetic research of modern Southeast Asian populations suggests that Denisovans dispersed widely across Southeast Asia, where they interbred with migrating modern humans 45.7 and 29.8 thousand years ago. According to a 2021 genetic analysis, modern humans, with the exception of the Denisovans, never interbred with any of these Homo erectus, unless the kids were unviable or the hybrid lineages have since died out. Despite previous research, Scientists found no genetic evidence of an earlier migration that gave people in Australia and Papua New Guinea their ancestors. The vast majority of their forebears, if not all, are descended from the same wave as Europeans and Asians. Other researchers, however, came to a substantially different conclusion on that topic. They discovered that 98% of each person's DNA in Papua New Guinea can be traced back to that one migration from Africa, the remaining 2%, though, appeared to be much older. They concluded that all people in Papua New Guinea have a trace of DNA from an earlier wave, that left Eurasia 140,000 years ago and then vanished. These early human pioneers could have survived for tens of thousands of years, if they still existed. Yet, when the last wave of humans arrived, the first generation vanished. They may not have been technologically advanced, and because they lived in small groups, a subsequent, more successful wave may have easily wiped them out.